Welcome to Great Conversations. My name is David Leonard. I am Chair and Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Critical Culture, Gender, and Race Studies. And today we're joined by Monica Miller, who's a visiting uh, professor in Religious Studies at Lewis and Clark, and soon to be uh, Assistant Professor in Religion uh, and Africana Studies at Lehigh University. Welcome to the Great Northwest. Well, you're actually coming from the Northwest, so. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, David. It's my pleasure. So talk to us um, about your book, because obviously your work covers a range of topics, but uh, one, of, one of the areas that you're most known for <coughs> is your work on religion and hip hop. So talk to us about your recent book, Religion and Hip Hop, and, and how it fits within your larger work. Absolutely. Well, it's a great question because the title is a little misleading, and so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, but um, I didn't, uh, religion, when I was writing what became religion in hip-hop, I was on a track of trying to explore the quest for meaning in hip-hop culture, and so for me, the quest for meaning was this larger rubric that was a sort of indispensable and kind of umbrella sort of way of describing the religious without locking the religious into mm -hmm. institutional mm -hmm. motifs or locking it into um, a particular religiosity like Christianity, which is done more often than not in religion and hip hop scholarship. And so I was thinking to myself, well, how can I expand the category of religion big enough and wide enough to sort of encapsulate all of these things that are going on in hip hop? Mm -hmm. And so I was about 150 pages into the book, and I had this aha moment like, oh, I'm participating in the same thing that I'm deconstructing, you know, other trends for doing. And so I was 150 pages into the book, and I realized that the way I was uh, sort of approaching the category of religion needed more interrogation. Okay. And so I came up with this idea that when you look at religion and hip hop scholarship uh, throughout the years, um, especially those most interested in showing different dimensions of religiosity, why rappers make use of the religious, or why religious themes continue to proliferate in hip-hop culture more broadly, I realized that what we scholars call religion, that object, that category, has remained completely uninterrogated in the field of study. And so with the sort of predominant approach to religion in hip hop being a more theological, a more Christian, a more confessional, a more church based approach, I wanted to approach the category of religion as social formation and process. So what that means is that uh, looking at the way religion operates in hip hop would be the same way we would explore race, the same way we would explore gender, that religion is just another non-unique way of talking about the social world. Mm. And so after I was, you know, played with being 150 pages in, I began again. And so my conclusion is called beginning again. And so in this way, mm. religion and hip hop is a sort of thought experiment. And um, the, rather than asking what is religious about hip hop culture, I sort of take that um, most, you know, sort of widely used phrase, and I flip it on its head and I ask, what do uses of religious grammar in hip hop accomplish for competing social and cultural interests? So the second thing I had in mind was to expand the data of hip hop. So most folk writing uh, in the area of religion and hip hop scholarship, again, uh, for them, hip hop means rap, rap right. music or rap, rap lyrics, and certainly rap lyrics are sort of chock full of religious play and theological play and sort of philosophical musings, but I wanted to expand the data of hip hop to include documentary films. Mm -hmm. I wanted to expand it to hip hop culture, not that hip hop and youth culture can be conflated to one or the other. I wanted to do a more ethnographic sort of, you know, um, social scientific uh, study. And really in that book that I'm asking, uh, scholars who employ the category of religion, scholars who want to explore the category of religion in this wider rubric that we call culture or material culture, what is the scholar's responsibility? Mm -hmm. How ought we treat the category of religion? And so I came up then, um, religion and hip hop is that thought experiment. And it's interesting because the word and that separates religion and hip hop is part of what I'm deconstructing in the book. I obviously didn't have control over that title. I would have uh, rather, what would you, yeah, what yeah would you so title it? something like religion in hip hop. So again, religion and hip hop is one of the trends that dominates the field of study. I call it the collision model because it assumes that 
religion is something that is sacred and hip hop is something mm -hmm. that is secular and I'm very much interested in what that and is doing. Okay. So I see religion and hip hop as sort of settling the score between the sacred and the profane. So, which leads me to my next question. I know you just gave a talk not too long ago at Columbia where you talked about uh, Kanye and Jay-Z's uh, Watch the Throne and uh, the No Church in the Wild. Mm -hmm. So do you think, is that, is that a rejection of religiosity or is it a rejection of the institution uh, is it similar to your rejection of, of the paradigm or the way that religion is often constructed in and around hip hop? That's a perfect question because we are in this moment in terms of what, how to think about religion in the American landscape. We're in this moment where you know a lot of social scientists and analysts are involved in a lively conversation about what they're calling the decline of belief in America, right? So now we have this new category called the nuns, and in fact, I'll be talking a little bit about that tonight. We have this new category uh, called the nuns, and they not, do, not like no, so not N U N. So not, it's not not uh, Julie Andrews and Sound of Music nuns. <laughs> no, not, so the N O N E, okay, just, right? So this like, kind of you know this uh, sort of empty signifier in a way, and the way they came up with this category was really looking at the way in which people were responding to whether or not they participate in institutional religion or whether or not they have a religious affiliation. So when 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 folk were sort of checking the none of the above, that these options, I don't fit into these options, the assumption was that either belief is on a decline or that religious affiliation is on a decline. And so recent uh, data, uh, social scientific data, suggests that now one in five Americans claim no religious affiliation. And so now there's all of this talk about who are the nuns and you know what do they believe in and how do they choose politically. And it's been really interesting to sort of watch what I call the creation of the nuns. So um, in my book, there, there, there is no group called the nuns. They're only um, a group of people that they've lumped together, uh, social, you know, in terms of uh, the, the science behind it. They lump them together according to the way in which they all respond to one question. Okay. Um, and so for me, in terms of being a scholar of religion, not participating in institutional religion or claiming no religious affiliation tells me very little about what those categories do and what those categories mm -hmm. are and it tells me more about those that are making the categories themselves right so in terms of what i really like about the no church in the wild video is that it gets people riled up people get upset about that like wait you know they're talking about no church in the wild and then they're talking about philosophy but then they're doing all of these like nihilistic and pathological and fleshly things that they're not supposed to be doing and now they're like deconstructing monogamy and now they're talking about like cocaine and like what's going on here right so again I think that the sort of the aesthetic of the video sort of presents us with this dilemma of nihilism again and so because more often than not we think of the category of religion as purely affirmative right or something that is purely of value purely moral something that's supposed to do good in the world right we don't um usually approach it outside of that in the field and i think it's unfortunate so um for in in, in terms of my work um, i have a large-scale survey project in portland oregon called remaking religion and so what's been really interesting about living in portland is that i am where they call um, you know, the, we have the largest rates of unaffiliation. So Portland, Oregon, so in particular, the, the Northwest in general, the mountain capital. it is the it's ground zero for the nuts, right? Um, and so again, I feel like a lot of uh, the the conversation that surrounds who are people in Portland or people in the mm -hmm. Northwest in general, they typically label them as nuns, but we don't know much about their daily lives. Like we don't know much about how they talk about religion. We don't know um, how they play with religion and or spirituality in their everyday practices. So what I chose to do was to come up with a survey, but also take social inheritance into account. And so by tracking young people um, and looking at the various practices of youth culture, whether it's tattooing and body modification, hanging out on the corner, through this survey project, I'm able to sort of take stock um, of what young people not believe, but how they talk about religion. And it's interesting because they reject that category of religion. And so I saw a lot of rejection in that music video. But I'm mostly interested in why people get upset about that, right? Mm. Or 
um, why, you know, we get really upset when rappers spit blasphemous lyrics, and I'm not quite certain that it is the job of the scholar to kind of play the role of the sort of moral therapist in that way. It's not my job whether to say this is uh, this shouldn't be religious or this is religious. I'm really interested in talk of religion and mm. what talk of religion accomplishes for people and what I mostly find with young people, and this is why I think taking social inheritance uh, into account is very important, and I'm definitely a Burdouin in a sense in terms of habitus, uh, though our, our primary socializations have a lot to do with the way we talk about the social world. And so what we often hear as talk of religion um, or sort of, uh, you know, claims to particular uh, forms of religiosity are really just habits. It's habits mm. of talking about the world in a certain kind of way. And so when I talk to young people in Portland, they talk about the world in a certain kind of way because they were raised in a house where they had parents that were atheists or, you know, they were middle to upper middle class. They were able to read books and think critically about this category that we call religion. Um, and what's interesting with black youth in particular, black youth um, over and against their white and Hispanic counterparts, you know, Kathy Cohen's work has shown this in her data with the Black Youth Project. Um, they sort of espouse higher rates of what they call subjective religiosity. Again, I think that has very little to do with what they believe in their everyday life, and I think that has more to do with um, hearing grandmama talk about religion in the church at the table, hearing mom talk about God in a certain kind of way. So it becomes part of your habit in talking about the social world. Mm -hmm. So the dilemma bringing it back to the research, the dilemma this poses for the scholar um, of religion or the scholar interested in this kind of talk in the world is how do we measure that? Right. Do we measure that in terms of belief? Are we really measuring you know, claims to belief? Or are we just kind of measuring non-unique talk about the social world? And then how do we sort of hold, um, how do we adjudicate for habitus, primary socialization, um, you know, things that are really um, more durable, those durable dispositions that are part of our grammar. So, you know, this, this kind of notion that, well, you know, we're not always fully conscious of why we do what we do. And, you know, if we take our social theory to task in um, a really strong kind of way, then if we put our, our own social theory to work, then we know that we're not always fully aware of why we do what we do. So I'm really interested in the logic of practice. Um, in that sense, and I haven't fully worked it out because on one hand I feel that uh, social, you know, those working um, in the intersections of religion and social science, you know, I, I do like that methodology and I do think it's an important methodology to kind of counter the more exaggerated journalistic claims mm -hmm. that we often get wrapped up into, right? So if we listen to what Bill Cosby says about, you know, uh, marginal youth or youth of color, I mean, he's making these ideological claims with very little data. And in fact, if we were to look at, you know, uh, crime reports or data, they probably would deconstruct what he's saying, right? Because, so, but, so it's interesting, but I also um, feel like we privilege social science over what we call maybe the more journalistic. So what do we then right. do? Um, are we privileging a certain kind of empirical data? Are we privileging a certain kind of positivism? So for me, this video was fun in that it got people riled up and I'm really interested in, you know, why people get upset, you know, about this kind of talk and the pairing of this talk with those seeming contradictions of life that they don't feel should be a part of uh, the, the talk of religion. So, so do you think the reaction to uh, the, the entry of the religious into the secular in this context, mm -hmm. uh, like the existence of nuns, the kind of reaction is about law, fear of loss of control. Absolutely, and not, I actually don't think that the, you know, the the and it's the manufacturing of the nuns because to me that is the the nuns are not a real category. Right. They only exist in the analyst imagination. Right, right, right. Um, you know, we could ask 500 people, do you eat pizza? You're right. So if they all eat pizza, what now we, we get to we can attach create meaning. a group. And now we can attach meaning. meaning and now, the, you know, and it's fascinating. The pizza eaters are taking right. over. So once they, you know, found this new group right. called the nuns, what they did after that was all of these, you know, pieces started coming out. 
um, about, well, if you are nun, then that means you experience, you know, certain kinds of trauma. Or if you're a nun, you're more likely now to vote for Obama. Or if you're a nun, you know, um, you might be more prone to uh, mental illness, say, for example, or certain um, ideas of mental well-being, right? And so it's interesting um, in how these categories become constructed, what kinds of political agendas right. get attached to this category that's not really real, but is only real in the analyst's imagination. So here's where I think the, the, the drama, I think we're obsessed with belief in this country, and I don't think it has much to do with the, the anxious narratives of religious decline in terms of institutional religion. I don't think it has much to do with a religious affiliation. I mean, Religious affiliation tells us very little. I think I'm still a member of the Baptist Church, but I mean, I so on the books. I'm, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think it's about belief. And what they found with this new group called the nuns is that while they claim no religious affiliation, or they prefer language of spiritual but not religious, or they're kind of bucking up against this institutional motif of religion, 68% of them still claim a belief in God or higher power. Well, and it's it's interesting that the that the fear that there seems to be a rejection among this group of categories, and the first response is to categorize. To categorize, that's right. That's exactly right. And so I, that's a brilliant point, David. And I think that's exactly what's going on here. But I think if we were to have the same, the going back to how I want to understand religion as social formation and process, religion as non-unique talk about the social world. Um, if we had this conversation that we're having about religion in terms of race, we would be like, wait, no, we know we can't do that. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. Or gender, right? right. Like, so, you know, um, okay, well, if this group, you know, agrees that blackness no longer, you know, fulfills their cultural or political needs, well, let's like make up a new category and just say that's what they are because they're rejecting this category of blackness. Like, that's not what we do, right? We know blackness or, you know, race, right? We know these things to be social constructions that have very real effects in the world, but we know we're not studying blackness, right. the essence of blackness, right? Because blackness is just, you know, whatever the agreed upon social markers of, of what it is and what it does in the world, right? Um, so how do we then treat religion in that same manner? So let me bring a, a bring a couple things together and see, uh, get your thoughts. Because one of the things that I think I learned and I would identify as an aesthetic of hip hop is its ability to, to, to challenge expectations, to challenge the notion of what constitutes uh, respectable, what constitutes acceptable, uh, what constitutes Professional, and so if we think about uh, the way in which clothing has been challenged, sure. uh, sartorial choices, uh, and how those uh, clothing choices that have long been seen as undesirable and threatening and criminal uh, have been not only embraced, but also the way in which hip hop artists uh, or others have said, "Well." you seem to value this sort of clothing, let's look who's worn that clothing. Right. Uh, how does that kind of anti-categorization, uh, the kind of repelling of simple boxes that, that uh, of and in those categories play out in a religious uh, realm? Does that explain <laughs> or help to us to think about the way in which youth, as you talked about, are kind of refashioning mm -hmm. and remixing mm -hmm. uh, religion. And yeah. I mean, it is, is the notion of, of kind of sampling I as, think an, as, as an aesthetic, right. does yeah. that play out in, in a religious or context? Or a certain kind of bricolage, right? right. I mean, and I think you, you know, hit the nail on the head, David. The reality is this, this dilemma that we find ourselves in is not a new dilemma. Things have always been that way, right? Things have always been, you know, sort of mixed up and, you know, complicated and there's bricolage and, we, you know, we use syncretism right. as a kind of rubric, all, you know, um, although those, you know, even those kinds of categorizations have, uh, you know, their own crisis of origins and essence and that type of thing. But I think that's exactly right. So I think, I think the first thing is that, you know, um, 
that the way we live our li we live our lives in very complex sorts of ways, right? So I can you know think back when I was a teenager and I wasn't I was kind of rejecting the church and I was like playing with some other stuff and depending on my social situation, you know, I would sort of you know make do or sort of poach that you know uh religious life world that made sense to me so if i'm i have i'm a nervous flyer as you know right so if i'm in a plane flying i might like you know when i was a teenager i might like you know decide to talk christian or make use of christian grammar right because it's comforting for me right in that moment it's helping me to cope and you know then when you know i am faced with another situation i might be more humanist and more skeptical i think that the play with religion that we see in youth culture and culture in general in hip-hop especially it's tricky it's witty it's spontaneous and it's often used to just talk about the self. Mm -hmm. It's often used to, um, you know, so if Tupac is doing this cool theological reversal of, you know, heaven, he's gonna call it a thug heaven, and then he's gonna put people there that really shouldn't be there. Um, I don't know if he's trying to make some coherent theological statement on Christianity per se, but I do know what he's doing is really sort of constructing um, a messy social world that, that he would like to see people be okay with, people be comfortable mm. with, trying to. So I think that the way the category of religion is used in hip hop, it's often used as a means of, as, as, as it's an aesthetic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, who wouldn't want to, you know, sort of perform the, you know, their, their, um, their life as God or to call themselves God? That comes with a lot of capital and weight in our society. Right. Or to play with talk of the devil in a certain kind of way, you know, or to talk to God like he's your homie. Right. So, again, like as a scholar of religion, I don't see any of those things as contradictions because my job is not to analyze this data and look for the religion or look for the, the belief itself. I'm looking at, well, then what do all these complex configurations serve for various interests in certain social and cultural economies and when i do that and when i take that approach i come you know the 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 analyses you know sort of reveals all sorts of interesting things rather than saying oh in this interview tupac is being christian or tupac is like a black jesus mm -hmm. right i think that's um there's for that's well to me it's not that interesting i think it's too easy to make those kinds of claims and it doesn't tell me much about what tupac is up to right. right so i know i'm not sort of measuring intentionality i'm not measuring consciousness i'm just looking at the complex configurations of what particular uses mm -hmm. of grammar serve in certain you know um in certain you know moments and instances but i think it's so mushed together in hip hop and in youth culture that play with religion, that play with spirituality. I mean, I think about the young kids in Portland, Oregon, mostly Caucasian, you know, demographic, uh, mostly progressive in terms of politics. And, um, you know, it's interesting when you even look at their fashion. Um, you know, I was talking to one kid who um, I was surveying on the street and he had this tattoo and it was like a tattoo of a zombie carrying a cross with a picture of the government or something in the background. And he says, you know, so I begin to ask him about it all fit tattoo. together perfectly. Yeah. So on the street, if you were to pass by that young man, you'd look and you'd see a cross and you'd be like, oh, okay, sick, standing for Christianity. Like you would assume, right, that the cross signifies something of a certain kind of belief. And he was an atheist. And so his mm -hmm. idea with that tattoo was that for him, what zombies and religion or zombies and Christianity and the government all have in common is that they all recruit. And that's what he wanted to sort of signify with that. So I always say that, you know, um, appearances cannot be trusted at first glance, right? And so because they cannot be trusted at first glance, um, that means then the scholar or the analyst must give thought to, well, now ter in terms of theory and method, what do we do with this data? How do we make use of what's going on here? Um, how are we going to organize this data to tell a certain kind of story? Um, and I really think at the end of the day, we're all social and political architects. We're all kind of weaving together in some way, right? You know, these kinds of stories that, um, you know, that we want to live by, that makes sense to us. And so my approach is very different. And so, you know, in terms of the approach that I take to how to make sense out of this bricolage and the messy uses of religion, you know, some folk would argue that it's too reductionistic or, you know, that it's too careful or um, that I really emptied that category of religion of having meaning. So it also, I think in the same way that we become obsessed with belief, 
we're also obsessed with preserving meaning in a certain kind of way. So, oh, well, if we just make talk of religion, you know, talk about the social world or talk about the self, then that means it doesn't have any meaning. So we're on this kind of search and quest for meaning, like, you know, we're like existentialists right. looking for meaning or no meaning or the collapse of meaning. And I don't think there's meaning or no meaning. I mean, it, it, these things are the stories that we make them. So how, um, you brought up tattoos, and I think it's really interesting in that regard, because here we have uh, what some would say is a, a, not only a secular practice, but a practice that uh, in quote unquote desecrating one's body mm -hmm. uh, violates uh, certain religious principles. Uh, yet at the same time, we, we look, when we look at tattoos, um, and particularly, well, just because I have looked at them in the sports world, right. a lot of those tattoos are very religious based. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so what does that, I mean, what does that tell us that, at, that this practice um, that in many ways is about self, is about controlling one's body, is about marking oneself, uh, is at the crossroads mm -hmm. of connection to uh, larger themes and tropes of religion, uh, larger sense of community, yeah. of being part of something bigger. Uh, so it's yeah. the crossroads of individualism and collectivism. That's right. It's a great question, um, David. I myself, you know, we talked about our tattoos before. You know, we're all you know, all tatted up, and um, even myself. I mean, I've got symbols on my body that I don't necessarily think would reflect something of my own conscious commitments in terms of uh, religion or spirituality um, in, in that sense. But I think overwhelmingly, like you mentioned, sports, and I think especially uh, when it comes to rappers in particular, we know that uh, religious tattoos proliferate, right? And um, we can think of Tupac and just the marking of the body. And I think in that way, uh, the way that I've tried to sort of come to understand it is thinking about it as a sort of faith in the flesh. I think um, it's an overwhelmingly like humanist sort of practice uh, in a way. Um, and there is something about kind of marking uh, the body and, and, you know, sort of seeing the positionality of these tattoos. And, um, you know, again, it's always interesting. I, I move a lot, right? So, you know, I mean, I do move a lot, a lot, but just in terms of the way my tattoos move on my body, in some way they kind of tell a story. So I've got this one tattoo that's playing with Jesus in a certain kind of way that speaks to where I was maybe seven years ago, mm -hmm. not in terms of my own, you know, uh, religious belief, but just where I was intellectually, the things I was involved with. And so I don't know if the sort of the configuration of tattoos on bodies can tell a story. I mean, we leave that to the subject to say whether or not it tells a story on their body. But I think it is a certain kind of faith in the flesh. I think overwhelmingly it's a sort of, uh, not faith in a theological sense, but it's a sort of faith in the self in a way. It's um, the kind of inscripting you know, one's ideas about the world on their body, right? With this certain kind of idea of permanence that these things will be there until the day that I leave, uh, you know, this world, until the day that I die. And so I think there's something really cool and really interesting about kind of marking faith or marking religiosity or symbols in that mm -hmm. manner onto the body. So in that way, the body is canvas. Right. Yeah. So do you think one of the ways that and maybe, and this isn't limited to, to mm -hmm. youth, but the, the, I don't want to say the disconnect between youth culture and tattoos might be an embracing of this, is that, that youth and maybe a post, well, I don't want to locate it, but there's an embracing and an acceptance of contradiction uh, in, in ways uh, that I'd say is pretty transparent. Yeah. Uh, that, and we might see that in the tattoos that are, that are really embracing uh, the level of, of complexity and contradiction mm -hmm. in self. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a, a rub between uh, youth that you're looking at in Portland and, and beyond mm -hmm. and, and religion that, that the, the contradiction is, is in many religious contexts is, is sought to be concealed. I think that's exactly right. And I don't think it's, again, this new thing or this 
you know, overly conscious thing. I think that we scholars and analysts struggle with it more because, you know, we think about, oh, religion and hip hop, the sacred and the profane, that's a contradiction. Right. So we set up our own straw men in a way by kind of approaching it as this contradiction. You know, this is why people get bent out of shape with Meek Mill's song, Amen, right? Oh, he's got to apologize. You know, uh, you know, he's spitting blasphemous lyrics, you know. Um, I think that thing is, it's curious to me. It's interesting to me um, because it does sort of assume then that life is not about contradictions or that which we call contradictions rely upon, you know, a sort of essentializing mm. of a this and a that. Um, and I don't know what a this and a that is. And the young people that I talk to overwhelmingly, whether they're, you know, middle class Caucasian youth in mostly white Portland, Oregon, or if I'm talking to youth of color in Philadelphia, um, the way they live, they live their lives comfortably in tension. And I think we all do. I think that um, it especially becomes um, a problem for the analysts in particular. So I think the analyst has the issue with contradiction, not necessarily people just living their lives. Well, we know, I mean, because as you said from the beginning, the analyst wants the category. Right. And, 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 yeah. and to explain the characteristics of the markers. Yeah, you know, right. of, uh, of and within that category yeah. and, and the contradictions uh, invariably disrupt. And those they disrupt. Categories. That's exactly right. And then we sort of, you know, in our own work, we kind of um, act surprised with the disruption of it, like, oh, this is okay for this person to do this and that, right? But it's not a, oh my goodness, it just it is, right? And so it takes us by surprise, but it doesn't take the people living their lives as surprises, right? Um, in that way, like it's not a contradiction for them, it's a problem for us. So in other words, we struggle with the categorization. And I think, David, mm. you touch on something really important because I think if we do pay attention to, you know, this sort of indelible mark of faith in the flesh and tattooing and body modification and the ways that those things kind of push up against a certain kind of respectability, say for example, oh, if one's religious, one can't, you know, um, wear their bodies in certain kinds of ways. One can't perform their ideas about the world in certain kinds of ways. Um, these, these young people overwhelmingly don't have neat categories for anything. Yeah, and I mean, I think this plays out um, in in really clear ways. The look at at, at the the data about nuns, and then simultaneously, there's been all these writings, and mm -hmm. our colleague Ebony Utley is, is working on marriage and others yeah, that yeah. people want to link those together. Like, look, yeah. there's declining interest in in uh, religious affiliation and marriage is on the decline and then yeah and, and, then, it's they, and then they just collide well then they stick yeah. them together and, and they explain each other as opposed to, to me, unpacking each of them and that's exactly right and i think um you know we scholars and analysts are very good at you know and when especially when it comes to the construction of the nuns and who are they and you know we're always sort of on the lookout for discovery you know mm -hmm. we're like you know we this with this kind of colonial mindset you know um in a way i think we're really good at manufacturing crisis we're really good at manufacturing crisis right and so all it takes is for us to say something is dead all it takes is for something to you know oh this is on the decline or it's belief no more or you know the belief in god is declining and what do we do with that so we create the the, the discursive terrain of crisis talk what it does at the end of the day is it just provides more terrain for us to write more articles about a crisis and more books about a crisis that's not really crisis <laughs> there is no academics you know, um, and commentators and you know, politicians creating crisis. You know, so I we're really, imagine. you know, it's a, that. So in my book, in religion and hip hop, one of the things uh, that I do look at closely is the production of moral panics, right? Okay. Um, because I think that we get really panicky when we start to talk about hip hop as religion or religion in hip hop or religion and hip hop because those two things are not supposed to go together. Right. So the assumption is, well, how do you make them work? Because they're not supposed to go together. And my answer is the only reason why they're not supposed to get to go together is because we're relying on this very modernist kind of bifurcation of the sacred and the profane. And again, that's about not, you know, sort of mixing things up in the way that you were just talking. So, so how does how does uh, uh, race or sexuality fit in not only that construction or articulation of the binary between the sacred and the profane, 
uh, but also the, the construction of crisis? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I think that, um, well, I'd say two things. In terms of the way the categories operate, I mean, you know, as someone who works at the intersection of, you know, um, multiple signifiers of difference, we know that talk of race is never just talk about race. It's always talk about sexuality, whether or not we're talking about sexuality in explicit kinds of ways. And talk about class is always talking about gender. And talk about gender is always talk about race, right? Whether we acknowledge it or not. So when I hear, you know, grammar of religion being talked about in certain kind of ways, I'm always thinking about inheritance. I'm always thinking mm -hmm. about um, socialization and that, you know, kind of familial inheritance, right? So I'm already thinking gender and race and, you know, sexuality, that the way one talks about religion uh, says a lot to me about the way one talks about gender and the way, right? So for me, that's why I think we need to approach the category of religion in the same way in which we'd approach the categories of race, gender, and sexuality. And in terms of moral panics, it's really interesting, David. So, you know, in, um, what I do in the beginning of religion and hip hop is I kind of revisit this nappy headed ho Don Imus thing, right? And, um, you know, trying to sort of take stock of the, the moral panic and, you know, what people were saying about what and who these girls were and that kind of thing. And when I step back and I really took a look at the situation, what's interesting is that with this over focus on race, right, with this over focus on nappy headed as this kind of racialized signifier, you know, we failed to also hold Ibis accountable for his heteronormativity, right? That these girls, you know, didn't perform their femininity in, mm. you know, the appropriate right. ways, right? So, um, and then that says something about, you know, uh, their sexual orientation, whether he's talking about that or not. And what's interesting is when he says, you know, well, the reason why I think I can say these, you know, words, um, you know, has something to do with, you know, the way rappers talk about these things, you know, so effortlessly. So if rappers can do it, then what's the big deal, right? And so what we did as a community was fascinating. I feel like we jumped on that bandwagon and we go and we scapegoat, you know, hip hop. Imus gets his job back. We're not so much more focused on Imus anymore, but now we're focused on holding hip hop accountable for the production of this grammar, right? And we know hip hop only reflects the best and worst of American society, that those things are never in a vacuum on their own. And so I feel like the nappy headed hoe case, you know, sort of is this moment where you know, we're focused on race and then we miss the mark on gender and sexuality, right? We miss the mark on class. We miss the mark on the this and the that, right? Mm -hmm. We miss the mark on, oh, these college girls and then these nappy-headed hoes, right? So in some way, the ontology of the nappy-headed hoe was never, you know, sort of denied. She just wasn't embraced, right? right. No one said the nappy-headed hoe don't exist. You know, the nappy-headed hoe might exist, but she's not your average Spelman college student, say, for example, right? Or, you know, she's... Uh, you know, not your respectable type. So it's really interesting how, you know, discursively the nappy headed hoe becomes rejected while at the same time there's very little conversation about heteronormativity, very little conversation about class and gender and, you know, some of the girls with tattoos and then now they're rough and hard looking, right? So that says something about the way they're performing these things. And, you know, so with the scapegoating of hip hop and then it becomes religious, right? So then, churches get involved in the conversation, right? Um, you know, which is not a surprise in, you know, political talk in the black community and churches are uh, overwhelmingly um, and disproportionately involved in that conversation, but it brings to the table a certain aspect of morality and, you know, a certain aspect of, you know, what what's the right thing to do here, right? Coming from a certain Christian perspective. And then before you know it, we're burying the N-word. We have this, you know, with, we've got these ministers out there, we've got this horse and carriage, we've got this headstone, we're going to bury the N-word, and it's just fascinating to me. <laughs> The, the, you know, the sequence of events mm -hmm. and how we get from here and what was not talked about and then this kind of crisis becomes manufactured and now we're, you know, putting to death, you know, uh, language that we're still using. And Don Imus is still... Don Imus has his job. And a lot of dollars. And a lot of dollars. And we're still not talking about gender and sexuality as much as we're talking yes. about the other signifiers. Yes. So, it's interesting, right? And so we kind of, um, so I'm also, in, in that way, I'm also very much interested in the discursive, how we kind of, how our conversations and how our grammar constructs, you know, um, you know, particular ideas and constructs, you know, a certain discourse that we then jump on and sort of analyze as really happening in the world and the way we treat those happenings. Okay. So I know we could be here all day. So Indeed. Let's land and, and go. <laughs> Talk about all sorts of things, and that's one of the amazing things about your work.
um, is because it touches and connects and complicates uh, the everyday uh, and the things that we accept mm -hmm. uh, and take for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, so just switching up, tell us about the everyday that you uh, engage. I know on your, on your, uh, one of your websites you talk about how reality TV and, and junk magazines <laughs> Absolutely. Junk. <laughs> Some people's junk or other people's, people's trash. That's right. That's uh, right. So I'm wondering if you could talk to us, yeah, about, because oftentimes, you know, like thinking of contradiction, mm -hmm. you know, we academics, commentators, cultural critics are assumed that, you know, we we just sit and read Derrida all day right, long. Right, right. Uh, or Dancing uh, with Purdue. <laughs> Right. Oh, yeah, hey, yeah. Isn't that coming up next next fall on ABC? Dancing. Oh yeah, that's right. That's it right. And aren't we? Yeah, we're a part of that. I think <laughs> that would so, actually be cool. And I do think academics need a reality TV show. David, I will leave that to you. All right. All right. <laughs> I think we're pretty interesting creatures. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So my everyday. It's, well, so talking about the everyday. Um, you know, I wrote this book on race in Portland, and, and I mentioned that. Uh, because that was part of my everyday, and I ear hustle a lot. And so part of what I do is, you know, hang out in hotel lobby bars and hang out in dive bars, hang out in tattoo parlors, and just listen to people's conversations and take stock of how people uh, engage with me and react to me. And then when I tell them what I do, the kinds of questions they ask me, or then, they, you know, after they hear what I do, then they want to ask me about my piercings or my tattoos and things like that. So um, I took stock of all of this kind of talk and the, you know, collision experiences with uh, white men in particular in Portland around race and, and history and this kind of thing. And so I wrote a book, um, Portlandia, it's funny, so it's a, you know, this, you know, sort of, um, you know, little skit and, and, and kind of critique and, and kind of, you know, satire really on Portland um, that I think it's really hilarious. I think it's kind of like, well, the, here's life in Portland, one of the whitest cities in the United States. Here's what white people do in Portland. Uh, so I wrote a book called Blacklandia, which is about the subtleties of race uh, in Portland, of course, using myself as subject and, um, you know, kind of cataloging those experiences. So my every day could be, you know, hanging out in a tattoo parlor and or, you know, talking to people on a corner and, you know, talking to folk that live on the street or hanging out in one of the most expensive hotel lobby bars or the presidential hotels where I'm not really supposed to be and mm -hmm. I'm there kind of stirring up conversation and, you know, running in the bathroom to take notes and, <laughs> you know, so in that way, everything is my data mm -hmm. um, in that sense. And so um, my terrain is, is, is definitely wide and, you know, I don't watch a whole lot of TV. I do spend a lot of my time obviously reading and writing and uh, teaching and researching, um, but I do take some time to watch reality TV. I'm pretty obsessed with it. And I've, I'm more recently, I've been interested in a lot of the survival shows and interested in um, hoarders is very interesting to me. I think because I'm interested in ritual and anxiety mm -hmm. and compulsion, um, OCD-ness in some kind of way. And so I, it's, it's interesting uh, to watch those kinds of uh, reality TV shows. I was kind of stuck on the Kardashians for a while, not so interested. Um, in that anymore and um, definitely you know the housewives kind of thing and looking at that so I do love my junk magazines though and I was spending way too much money buying particular magazines so now what I do is when I take breaks I go into the grocery store and I'll spend a couple hours flipping through the magazines and you know I, I feel like I've got to be up on what's going well, on in Hollywood what's going on with the stars Holly's pregnant now and I just it's interesting because I feel like even in my conversations with students um, or even what comes up in the classroom, it's like, I got to know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking at me like, you're pop culture. You got to know what's going on in the world. And, oh, did you hear about, you know, dot, dot, dot. I'm like, yep, just read about that. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so, but it's interesting. Um, I don't think it's an escape in some way. I just think that I'm very much interested uh, in the world at large and, and, and also interested in how the magazines portray certain people and the kinds of uh, stories that um, they write about right. um, and how they tell those stories and who they focus on and why do they focus on this one as much, you know, and, and not this one so much and, and what is it about their lives that make the media uh, fascinated with them and so for me it's all interesting to add. Well, and, sure. it, and it also fits with, with ritual. That's, that, yeah, very in, much so. In itself. 
Very much is so. part of people's ritual of to 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 get their weekly magazine. Absolutely. Uh, to find out what so and so. A perfect is. night for me could entail a glass of wine and you know Derrida or Butler, and a perfect night for me could also entail a nice glass of wine and you know In Touch magazine. Or something. <laughs> like you know, so it depends. It depends on what kind of night it is, but I enjoy both of them you know equally. And and at, at one level it, it is contradiction, and another it's not. Exactly. The complexity in our lives, which, right back where we started. Which is in itself. <laughs> The beauty of life. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your questions, David. This was a fun conversation. Thank you for stopping by yes. our beautiful uh, cultural house and for visiting the Palouse. Thank you.